and thank you for joining us to our international rounds. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Israel Valverde, who is uh, the head of the uh, pediatric unit in uh, Seville, in Spain, in the Virgen de Rocío Hospital. He's also has an appointment as an honorary lecturer at uh, the King's College uh, University in London with the Evelina Hospital. And uh, Israel, apart from uh, being one of the world experts in 3D is a friend, and uh, he's going to talk to us about advanced visualization tools in complex connected heart disease from 3D hybrid printed models, virtual reality to bioprinting. So, Israel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, hi, everybody, and thank you, Rafa. Thank you, everybody, for this amazing opportunity to, to speak here. I mean, it's a great honor. So I hope you may like the presentation. So the idea is to show you what we are doing about how to get the best of cardiac imaging. Um, try to be uh, enthusiastic about what we can get about 3D visualization tools. Um, I would like to say that I have no conflicts of interest. So let's start discussing about why we love anatomy and complex congenital heart disease, why we decided to understand the physiology and the anatomy and the complex relationship. And then we will discuss about how advanced 3D medical images, medical imaging can help uh, understanding the anatomy. How can we move from 2D flat screen to the open of 3D, the, 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 the 3D printing, the 3D world, and how can we help our colleagues to understand the anatomy regarding if we can present images in virtual reality, augmented reality, or 3D printing. And finally, uh, I would like to show you the first advantage, advan advances that we have get uh, in 3D bioprinting. So the idea, the initial idea is when you start as a fellow in pediatric cardiology, congenital adult uh, uh, CHC, um, it's so complex to understand what's a double of the right ventricle is uh, because we only provide 2D images. And then you have to try to explain to the surgeon why the BSD is related to the aorta, not the PA, because you only have one single plane. So, and also the interventionalist because all the information is right there. I mean, we have 3D imaging tools. So the idea is why not capturing the 3D imaging? Uh, so, so why not capturing the 3D imaging? And we have the stack of 3D imaging, then we do the segmentation, we do the CAD, which is the computer aided design until we have in our computer the 3D, uh, the 3D geometry of the heart. And once you have that, you can decide in which modality you want to show to your colleagues. But initially, the first step is which imaging modality. When I started as a fellow at the Bellina, uh, we had to say that we were the MRI team. So we didn't like the CT and we fight with our eco colleagues about which imaging modality was better to provide better images. Um, but now, uh, after so many talks about multimodality imaging, uh, it's when you really understand that it's all about combining multimodality imaging. It's not just presenting 3D echo and CT at the same time, it's just combining the images and present the two of them at the same time. Regarding, MR, regarding MRI, you can go for contrast enhanced or 3D balance SSFP, or CT, or 3D echo. What we have been working on the uh, uh, recent years, it's about combining the images so we, we can get the best of the two worlds, because you can get the physiology, uh, you can get the anatomy, you can get the valves, you can get the outflows from MRI or CT, but you really need the 3D echo. So how do you do that? So the way it's like, first, you have to align both uh, imaging modalities. You have the echo, you have the CT. And once you have the both imaging modalities, you can go for the segmentation. So you can, you can segment the valves 
because you have the 3D echo over there. And as you can see here, you can try to do the manual segmentation, which is really time consuming. I would say that for segmenting this patient with a complex a ABSD, it can take around 40 minutes, I mean, less than a radiology report. Um, and here you can see that we are segmenting the anterior, uh, uh, so the uh, anterior bridging leaflet on the left side, the aorta. And after this manual segmentation, you end up with the valves. And finally, you can segment the morphology of the ventricles, and then you can combine everything in one visualization, 3D uh, geometry. And after you finish that, uh, the next step is uh, what you have to do is just correct the image because sometimes you see that there is a BSD in the geometry that you have planned, which is not there. So you really need to correct that manually. That's where the work, you work together with the, with the engineer and the clinician. So once you have the 3D visually, once you have the 3D geometry, you can decide. Am I going to send it to the PDF? Am I going to send the 3D hard to virtual reality? Am I going to send the 3D hard to augmented reality or 3D printing? And again, similar to multimodality imaging, all these visualization tools, they have the limitation and the strength. So sometimes it's better to decide one or the other one, but combining the, uh, all of them, uh, I think that is the future. For example, this is one of the samples we have the Belina. What, 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 what do we do? So we insert the 3D model inside the PDF. It's easy to send. The surgeons can check at home. Um, it's, it's very handy. Um, although it's just showing a 3D heart in a 2D flat screen. What are the other alternatives? Virtual reality. For example, this is a patient with a large BSD. When we show that to the surgeons, they thought, okay, uh, it looks like I can separate the BSD, although I'm not completely sure. To me, it looks like a huge BSD compared to the small section. We were, we, we agreed with the surgeons, but we thought that we were showing too little septum in the echo because it was the only view, as you can see here, the only view that we could acquire with number one. The really nice plane showing the BSD and the large septum could be uh, the view number two, although it couldn't mm, be acquired because of the ribs. And then we thought, okay, why not uh, having a 3D mo a multimodality imaging like MRI, combining the two of them, and then showing the heart to the surgeon? As you can see here, this is my surgeon, Prof uh, Dr. Jose Impur. So, uh, what he's doing, he's in the virtual theater, so he's just checking the heart. He's, he's cutting the heart. The difference with the 3D printed model is the size of his heart is the size of the room. So he's inside the heart. And here, so he's uh, swimming uh, inside the heart. He's checking the, the cavity, he's understanding where the BSD is. And here is a, uh, there is a time when uh, uh, Mr. Jose Impul just check, okay, here is the BSD, but look at that. That's the septum. He just realized and understand that the size of the BSD is much more smaller than the septum. So he thought, okay, I can close that. And the baby, the, the baby can go out from the biventricular for, for the biventricular repair, and that's one of the first cases where we thought that virtual reality really improved the understanding of the geometry and the anatomy uh, for the surgeons. And uh, now we have improved the the virtual theater. Now we also have screen. I mean, in your virtual reality world, you have a screen with the CT. You can you can have different segments of the anatomy, the skin, the airway, the heart, the lungs, the guts, the esophagus. Um, it's really useful, not only for the surgeons, but also for the trainees, because um, it's a really cheap uh, device, $300.
um, and you can play with the heart as much as you want. Um, this is one of the studies uh, performed by my friend and colleague Tariq Hussain in Dallas, where we thought uh, that maybe uh, using virtual reality could be helpful for deciding if you can close uh, ASD with a PAPVD, uh, sinus venosus ASD with a PAPVD, because you have a library of stents and you can play around in your virtual reality model if the size of the stent is it's small or it's too much. But now, and one of the limitations of, uh, of the virtual reality that we found is that you cannot interact with your colleagues. So we see the surgeon trying to discuss, here is the BSD, although the other surgeon is not inside the virtual reality world. So we thought that maybe augmented reality could be the solution. In augmented reality, you have like a, a, some glasses which allow you to see the real world, but overimpose the 3D model, which will be helpful, as you can see on the left panel, for the sergeant before cutting the chest to understand where is the, what's the anatomy, where a PAPVD is. Uh, but on the right side, you see that it will be also helpful for the interventionalist because we can overimpose a translucent heart so they can see if they are advancing a Y or if they are advancing an electrophysiology study. Um, the technology has improved a lot. And what you see here is the new HoloLens 2. Um, we are making great advantages. Uh, technology is a bit uh, more expensive. Let's say something like $3,000 per device. Uh, but the good thing is we think it has a lot of potential. Um, finally, regarding the 3D printing, um, as you can see here, uh, this is the example that I showed you before. This is the, one of the patients at Evelina where we created a hybrid model combining the, uh, it was a patient with atrioventricular septal defect, a large BSD, uh, we were not completely sure about the cordal attachments. We show the cordal attachment from the left AV valve crossing the BSD, inserting into the trechas, into the septum. Um, and then surgeons were not completely sure if they could cut these cords and closing, septating the BSD. Uh, so what we did is just creating this hybrid model with all the cordal attachment, um, in words of the surgeons, it was really helpful to understand what they should do in order to decide either closing or setting the BSD or not. Um, and the good thing of the 3D printing is it really shows you the uh, spectrum of all congenital heart disease. Initially, we decided to use 3D printed model for a interventional planning, but for that, we really had to do the proper validation. One of the questions that they always ask is, how accurate is a 3D printed model? For that, what we did is we compare the measurements of 320 anatomical structures, like IBC, aorta, in the radiological images, and we compare that with the 3D printed models. The results, the 3D printed models are really accurate. There is a mean bias below one millimeter of accuracy of difference between the anatomy, the radiological images and the 3D printed models. And then what about the distensibility? Do they behave similar to the native tissue? Um, playing around with the thickness of the 3D printed model, we were able to create a thick 3D printed model, which it was soft enough for suturing and cutting and, uh, and using the scissors and scalpel. This is a patient that we did uh, for Nancy Fourier uh, in, in Montreal. Uh, it was a patient, it was a case of multiple uh, apical BSDs. They were not completely sure if they could take that and close the BSDs. And what they did is just uh, 
create a patient-specific patch based on the 3 d printed model, which was the patch that they used in the patient. Although they couldn't see what they were closing, they were sure that with this patch, uh, they were able to close all the BSDs in the 3D printed model, and that's what they could reproduce in surgery with no residual sham. And what about the distensibility for the pulmonary arteries? Okay, so what you see here, it's a simulation of a balloon dilatation of a stenotic pulmonary artery, where we use a high pressure balloon to open the pulmonary artery up to three times. Finding the right thickness, 0.4 millimeter of polyurethane in this model, we could open the balloon at the nominal pressure without burst, bursting, without rupturing the 3D printed model. So the kind of uh, properties that we are able to replicate is the same that we use in the specification of the balloons for the patient. Although for valvuloplasty, for small, for native, for valve tissue, it's not good to use polyurethane and we decided to use a different material, which is the tango, where you can open um, uh, aortic valve stenosis with a low pressure balloon. This is one of the first examples where we use the 3D printed model. It was a patient with aortic heart uh, hypoplasia. We thought that a larger stent could block and although a small stent could be a, a, the risk of migration, that's why we created a 3D printed model where you can play around, find the right stent, and then simulation. This is a complex case that we did with a team in Madrid with Jose Luis Antunegui. It was a lady who was not candidate for surgery because of the morbidities with a large ventricular outflow tract and, not, and also was rejected for interventional um, um, Valvul, uh, percutaneous valve intervention. Because of the uh, limitation of an, uh, a valve which opens and the size of the right ventricular outflow tract, which completely changed from systole and diastole, maybe uh, it's because 3D printed model completely failed before to find the accurate stent. So, what we thought is why not combining the largest diameter? Uh, a uh, diameter in systole for the right ventricular outflow tract and, uh, and the volume in diastole for the ventricle um, to reproduce the largest diameter. And that's what we did. We plan in the 3D printed model, why not using a stent for the melody valve and another stent as a landing zone, which, so as I said, one stent for the melody valve and the landing zone, which could be occluded with a vascular plug, and then you could have a competent melody valve. And that's what they plan in the 3D printed model. On the left panel is what they already plan, the pre-interventional planning, and the same that was already planned in the model was what could be reproduced in the patient. Uh, the dual technique, uh, the dual stent technique worked perfectly well, and the patient uh, is okay right now after this crazy uh, procedure. With my friend Marineves Velasco, uh, she planned about, um, do we really need 3D printed model for complex uh, geometries such as coronary artery fistula? Um, she asked about, uh, do we really increase the understanding of the fistula based on 3D volume render of 3D printed model uh, for a cath intervention? And this is what you can achieve uh, with the 3D printed model. It's not only uh, improving your understanding, it's also the simulation. And what she proved in this publication is that 3D volume render sometimes added some value, but 3D printed model always added some value to the interventionalist uh, in patients with complex coronary artery fistula. With my admire uh, now, Sir Shah Qureshi and Professor Eric Rosenthal and Marineves Velasco, we use the 3D printed model for planning closure of PAPVD and sinus venosus ASD defects. Um, initially, we were not completely sure about the risk of occlusion of the pulmonary veins. That's why we decided to use 3D printed model. Whatever you could plan in the 3D printed model, it's what you can reproduce in the patient later. Um, and it's a, it's a success. Now we don't send most of the patient for surgery. We can close uh, using interventions. With our colleagues, uh, for we can close now left atrial appendages, um, and with the adult 
uh, colleagues, they also request three D printed model for closing a uh, paravalvular leak closure. But not only for big guys like Shah Qureshi, but it's also helpful for trainees. This is a 3D printed model where we use for simulation of closing an ASD with a new, uh, with a new device. And later we improve the simulation uh, with uh, a new uh, phantom, pulsatile phantom, where we can change the 3D printed model and all uh, fellows can be trained in, for example, in this workshop, uh, they are trained, for example, uh, complex procedures. Um, it's good because the 3D printed model uh, doesn't have any radiation risk. Uh, the kind of radiation uh, that it emits, it's really low uh, and it doesn't complain. And then we also have used 3D printed model for surgical planning, although you, you are working in the largest center in this technology, there is nothing I can add here uh, comparing what we do with Professor Xi Wen Yu. Um, this is the first case that we use for to trying to help our surgeon to understand how to do a complex Nikaido procedure uh, with Nancy Poulier and, the, and Raúl Arson the, from the Montreal group, um, as I show the patient with the uh, apical PSDs. Um, this is similar to what I showed before. Um, and this is the largest study that we published uh, in uh, the European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery. We involved 21 hospitals from nine countries, so it's in Spanish. Um, we work with our colleagues in London, Leiden, Italy, Montreal, in Lebanon, and also in Chile. Whenever they have a complex case, they upload the CT images, MRI images to the server that we have. We quickly do the segmentation, 3D printing, and send, and send the 3D printed model back to them in order to decide. What was the approach that we used for, for that? We included 40 patients with complex congenital heart disease. Uh, most of them were patients with double open right ventricle and TGAs. Um, the approach that we use is um, Initially, before even checking the 3D printed model, they decide in the MDM meeting what they were going to do. And 12 patients was, they were decided for conservative management. And then they receive the 3D printed model and re, re, redo the MDM meeting. What we found is that in up to three cases, they change conservative management to surgery. And two of them, they change conservative management to biventricular repair. In most of the cases, the 3D printed models didn't change the surgical plan. But in up to 12 cases, they changed. They they changed. The, in 15 cases, they changed the surgical plan, which was later reproduced uh, in the theater. So, in summary, in up to 44 percent of the complex cases, not simple cases. A 3D printed model helped to redefine the surgery. In up to 15% of them, they changed either conservative or univentricular heart physiology variation for biventricular repair. And with my uh, admired Professor Anderson, who was the uh, leading surgeon at Evelina, we also create like a library of teachings where we get the best of his knowledge trying to explain the junior uh, surgeons how to deal with complex congenital heart disease, complex surgeries. So I think it's not helpful only for big guys planning complex surgery. It's also very helpful for trainees. But one of the limitations, and again, sorry, because it's in Spain, it's about the, the cycle of high. I have the feeling that with a 3D printed model, it's all about the big inflated expectations. And now I think we have achieved what we can get from 3D printed models. And now what we, what we have is similar to what we get. It's when you have to decide either move to away from your comfort zone or decide continue working with 3D printing. But I think the future is about 3D bioprinting. And for sure, 
it's similar to what happened to us with 3D printing. You cannot do by yourself. With 3D printing, you need the help of our engineer. And now with the 3D bio printing, you really need to bring together a group of people, clever people. We, we have the ideas, but we need them. We need engineers to decide computational fluid dynamics, um, and then bioengineering, and then biology. What you see here is the hypothesis that we have. Imagine we have a patient with a complex quartation. It's a neonate, we are going to do surgery, and the surgeons repair the complex art hypoplasia the best, way, the best way they know. But we think, why not providing a patch with the perfect geometry? with the most efficient hemodynamic uh, laminar blood flow. And then we do the maths, we create the patch, we do the 3D printing, and now we have to do, have a 3D printing which is good enough to recreate the geometry, but also which mimics uh, the interstitial tissue properties where we could see patient-specific cells where they can be differentiated to a smooth vascular myocyte, smooth and smooth cells, which are patient specific, and we could implant that patch to the patient. So it has the potential to grow, it has the perfect geometry, it has the potential to be repaired and grow. So no more stenosis, no more aortic arch repair. Um, so we sit down with the engineers and the, with, and with the surgeon and they say, okay. Let's plan the two ideal uh, repairs that you can do. And you have one repair at the, at, the, at the upper level, and then you have another repair. Okay, let's do another repair with a more extended arch. And then in the computer, we simulate the patch. I mean, as you can see on the right, both of them looks quite similar to us, but one of them should be, should be better. One, we have the, the patch, we can ask the surgeon, okay, can you, can you try to reproduce the surgery the same way that you will do in the patient? Okay, you have the patient. Let's try to reproduce what you have done in the computer. Okay, you open the art, and now you have to suture. And the next step is which of the geometries has a best flow? Which, no, because in, in geometry it looks better. Which has the most efficient energy lost, uh, the less uh, turbulent kinetic energy, the more laminar blood flow. And this is what we get with the help of our colleagues in, in, in Chile. With Sergio Uribe um, and Julio, um, they develop the pressure map and the wall shear stress map of the, of the two patients. Um, according to the pressures, um, the, on the upper row, row, you see the non-corrected patient, then the regular repair, and then the extended repair. If you check, the, the velocity is similar, the pressure is similar, but the wall shear stress is completely different. It's much better in the standard repair. And the point here is, shall we, or please, could we start moving forward, stop, uh, presenting cases with just diameter or peak velocity. There is a bunch of new parameters, amazing parameters that the engineers use to um, having fly, uh, aeroplanes or rockets. So why cannot we use the same parameters in the clinical practice? And according to the engineers, the standard repair has a more efficient blood flow than the regular repair. Okay, so now we are able to produce a patch. Now it's impossible for the cells to live in the patch that we create. Why? Because the patches that we do is so thick. We really need to create a, a net, like a spider web, um, which uh, with the material which is uh, biologically friendly for the cells. And we cannot use polyurethane here, we have to start using polylactic acid. The good thing of the polylactic acid is that uh, it, the cells can use that to, so they, they degrade that and they create their own tissue. So we are creating like the interstitial tissue 
similar to the collagen, similar to the elastin fibers here for the cells to be deposited here and to grow. Of course, we have to double check that the properties of this patch uh, behave similar to the native aortic tissue. Otherwise, we could put a patch there and it will blow uh, uh, with the pulsatility of the aorta. And right now we have the, pro the right properties. And now the next step is using mesenchymal stem cells. Why mesenchymal stem cells? Because they are very easy to get. You can get them from the fat uh, of the patient and they grow very well and they can be differentiated to vascular smooth cells. Uh, and the good thing is that they, once they grow and they are differentiated, they behave similar to the media tissue of the aorta. And as you can see here on the left are the pluripotential mesenchymal stem cells in the patch. You can see the grid of the patch. And at 12 days, how they can be differentiated to a vascular smooth uh, cells. And as you can see here, these are the stem cells living within the patch they are able to, they are seated on the top of the patch and they enter and they cover the whole patch. And the idea that we have is the only, the only um, layer that we have to worry about is the medium cell with a muscular a smooth cells because the endothelium will be endothelized uh, as happened with any ASD device and everything. And the, and the external phase will be created easily with just a blood, a blood clotting. And this is the example of how this, the cells penetrate uh, all over the patch. And we also tested the functionality of these cells. Now they, they see that they, they contract uh, after releasing of calcium. Uh, so that's very good because we want the patches to have uh, muscular smooth cells which are able to contract. Um, I really hope that at some day we will see that happening in our patients. Uh, but we know we have a huge uh, road ahead to make that happen. Um, it's happening because of all the people that you can see here from the team in Pediatric Cardiology Unit at the uh, Virgen del Rocío Institute of Biomedicine, my friends and colleagues at Evelina London, King's College, uh, Tariq in uh, Southwestern, uh, University of Seville, uh, Chile, um, University of Malaga. So thank you very much. Um, whatever question you have, I will be happy 